In Marvel's The Art of Storytelling, Jim Zub covers story structure, ideation, and tips that will help you make more compelling stories. Beyond that, we have way more lessons that will teach you every aspect of the comic making pipeline. Check it out at proca.com slash Marvel. Now, the first thing that everybody asks a writer is how do you generate ideas? I find when I'm moving, there's something very simple and visceral. Go for a walk around the park or, or get out of the house and just sort of change the space that you're in. I do have an office and I do have my whatever computer station or stuff, but I write on planes, I write in hotels, I've written in the back of a car on a, on a road trip, like whatever it needs to get done, it gets done. You sort of get yourself into a mode. People will say, do you have writer's block? And I occasionally do, but deadlines and the fear of missing those deadlines is a shockingly potent uh, bit of inspiration. As a professional, you have to be able to deliver at a certain base level. And there are times when the muses are kissing your fingertips and it's all just going to flow out there on the page and you cherish those moments because they don't happen as often as you would like. And it seems very easy and effortless and very empowering. But when it's not happening, you still do it. You still write, you still hit your minimum page count, you still stick on that schedule as best you can. And in some ways, when you push through those tougher spots and you come out the other side and you still made the thing, you're better for it because it's not about being inspired all the time or that that playful idea of art as the spark of creation or a lightning hitting you out of the blue or whatever other analogy someone wants to use. It's about getting down and doing the work and finding inspiration in the process, finding inspiration in attaching those pieces together despite your own misgivings today. And then when it happens and it keeps happening, you're like, oh, okay, I can still do this. I've still got the job. There's a thing that I tell my students all the time. They ask me about writer's block. They ask me about uh, what to do when, you know, something's going wrong on a project. And I say that on almost every single project I do, I still have a moment, whatever corny, dark night of the soul, can I do this, imposter syndrome, fear, all those things hit you. Like, oh, I can't do this anymore. Oh, I used to be able to write. And for some reason today, it's all junk. And I don't think I'm going to be able to finish this and I better call my editor and get myself fired. And then you come out the other side and you go, Phew. okay, I did it again. I'm alive. The difference is I've done that so many times that I no longer think I'm actually doomed. I go, oh, this is the part where I think I'm doomed. Well, that's annoying because I know I got to get through to the other side. But if you're early in your career and you have that kind of clutch of fear, I think you assume I'm not supposed to ever feel this way. And real creators and real artists, they never feel like that because this sucks so much. I must not be a real artist. I must not be a real writer because why would I be so hard and bad on myself? Or why would I not feel inspired? And what they need to learn is we all feel it. We all don't know or don't feel like we've earned what we've got or that we deserve any accolades or that we don't seem to have the skill today or whatever it may be. The difference is the, the tenacity to keep making stuff. You know, I will talk to people and they will pitch me a really good story and I go, oh, that's really nice. And they're like, great, because that's the one that's been stuck in their craw forever. And then I'm like, and now you got to do one every month, right? And now you got to do, okay, you came up with the first arc or the first mini series and then what, and then what, and then what? And I'm not saying that in a bad way, but you learn to smash ideas together. You learn to generate concepts and discard them almost as quickly because you can use it elsewhere. You don't get precious about the stuff. I'll do that now more than I used to because early on it felt like a crutch and it felt like a, like a Hollywood slicky gross kind of thing to do those. It's this mates this, you know, and you're just like, stop it, stop it. And yet now when you have a body of work, you no longer have to justify like, Hey, can I write a story that works? So now I can do the shorthand and I don't feel like I'm cheaping out because the base level of competency is assumed. So now I can just tell you, this is what makes this different, or this is how we're combining these ingredients to make a unique dish, or if not unique, very tasty, right? You know, is there anything unique? 
I don't know, right? It's hard to say. It can work really well with collaborators you've been with a long time because now I can do one of those with my editor. It's this meets that. And they're not going to be like, oh, so hokey. You know, they're like, yes, Jim will make it emotionally resonant. Yes, the action will be good. It will be in on time and it will meet our parameters. And this is a unique bit of, you know, interplay that he's added to the mix. So we're not wasting your time writing it out in a formalized manner and organized. On my website, I've got a lot of tutorials about how to write comics, how to pitch stories and things like that. And people have said to me, do you still write your pitches this way? And the truth is I don't. But that's because I've written 7,000 pages of comics. And so an editor doesn't need me to jump through the same hoops as someone who's just starting out. And so it's a weird thing where I'm like, do as I say, not as I do. But it's like, that stuff still matters. First impressions are super important. If I'm working with a new editor or at a different publisher, I definitely put a much more formalized structure into play. And then once you get to know them and the familiarity is there, you can pitch something over the phone, you can pitch something in a short email, and no one's gonna think you're unprofessional for it. And it's such a corny cliche, you have to, you know, you have to know the rules before you can break them, but it's so true. You know, there's a reason why everyone says it, right? And so me pitching differently now is a matter of, you know, professional experience and working relationships. The one thing that a lot of people I think don't appreciate is that no matter how skilled you are or your base level of competency, your ability to communicate with your collaborators is as valuable or more valuable than the work that you produce. Because we are making a thing. You know, comics are a real tight knit little, you know, uh, a package of creativity. And, and sometimes you do all the pieces yourself, but usually you've got your line artist, sometimes an inker, you know, a colorist, a letterer, an editor, these six, five people, you know, in the mix, we all want to be proud of the final end result. And so it's about getting my ego out of the way and also going, what's going to work for this group? That's why as early as possible in the process, I want to know who's drawing the book. I don't want to write a generic script for to be determined. I want to write a script for that artist and make sure that they love it because that's going to make the end result way better. I want to jump on the phone with them before the project starts and go, what are you most excited about this character, this project, this thing? And they'll usually tell me at least one thing that I wouldn't have put in there, but now I will because I want them to, you know, sparkle on the page. People forget you know, that assistant editors will become editors someday. And so if you treat your assistants really, really well, someday they're going to be the person in the, the position of power that's going to be able to hire you. So I always treat everyone at every level well in general, because they're human beings. And but also because, you know, they're going to move through this industry and you have no idea who is going to be the next whatever. And the number of times that I have met someone in a casual little conversation and they're a scrappy person who's putting together their first indie book. And five years later, they're the next big thing in comics. And they're like, oh yeah, Jim's always been cool. And you're like, of course, first of all, we've all gone through these journeys. And second of all, you deserve respect because you're a person and you're working hard like the rest of us. And thirdly, you never know, right? So just be good to everyone and then you never have any guilt about it, right? But these assistants, I would send them an email with my latest script and I will fill it up with all kinds of reference that normally people send the assistant editor to go get. First of all, now I know you have all the proper reference. And second of all, I just saved them hours. Guess who likes me a lot? That assistant editor, right? Figure out how you can make other people's jobs easier and they will always want to work with you. The number of students that I talk to and they're like, you know, their dream is to be a, a character designer, lead character designer. You don't, you don't want to do those lesser characters, it, you know, like there's going to be the job that they're going to say, we want someone to make only good flagship characters who are the most important. Cover artist is another one at all. You know, I would like to be the cover artist. And you're like, well, and you and many, many, many other people, right? So what about your work stands out and is particularly potent or amazing? and is going to convince someone on the other side of this, of course, you're the right person for the job. And this is another one of those things that uh, a lot of people, they kind of have their blinders on about. I talk to my students about this all the time. Yes, we know you want the job, but it's not about just showing your work and then us doing you a favor and giving you the job. 
It's about you breaking through with a message that says, I am the most qualified, I am the best fit on a quality level and also on a personal level, right? You're a great communicator, you're organized, you're on time, you're gonna make my job easier. And the work is stunning, it's already done. Like it's, you know, it's fist of the North Star, you're already dead. Like you, I've already got what I want out of this, you know? We all want the gig. And so in your mind, you're like, just give me the job. And it's like, take it, show me work that is undeniable. And then it's yours. No matter how much I learn, I am always still learning and you will always still be learning, you know, throughout this process. Mastery is always seems like it's just, uh, you know, a heartbeat away and you're going to think that you've broken through and you're like, well, this is all I need to know about fill in the blank. But there's always more there, you know, being being curious is valuable. Being humble is absolutely crucial and uh, being organized, you know, will save you a lot of time and pain and trouble. And so for me, when I think about where I started and where I'm at now, it all makes sense, even though it's this rambling, crazy, creative kind of journey, but moment to moment and project to project, I was always sort of looking and going, I can see why I got this gig because I did this other gig that made sense to the editor and they could see me in this sort of role. Make the kind of work that you want to put out into the world and you will get hired to do more of it. It's like Hollywood casting. You see certain actors and they keep showing up in certain types of roles and you're like, wow, they've been, you know, typecast. Everyone gets typecast. People will not imagine you in roles or genres or characters that you haven't shown that you could do a good job with, right? If you want to do, you know, dark and edgy material, then you've got to make dark and edgy kind of comics. No one's going to cast you for romance. If you all you've shown them is horror. I've literally looked at portfolios and I'm looking at the pages and I ask the student what they want to do. And it's completely different than what they're showing me in the portfolio because someone at some point told them you have to do this to get a job. And I'm asking them what they want to do. And it's not this. And I'm like, you can only get given what you've shown. No one will pay you until you show them work worth paying for. So the sooner you're able to complete work that shows that level of competency and you've got the confidence and the ability to communicate your desires, then doors can open. Writing comics isn't just superheroes. It's taking ideas and stories, condensing them as much as you can and presenting them to your audience. There's so much you can learn from comics that can strengthen the storytelling in your own art. Check out proga.com slash Marvel for more lessons from Jim Zub and from all the other comic pros teaching the most important subjects in making comics in our new course, Marvel's The Art of Storytelling. I hope to see you there.